Hey, I'm Jess. Welcome to Poetry Slice. Today we'll be reading three poems from Anne Carson's Men in the Off Hours, which is a book that I read really recently from the library and really enjoy. Overall, I am a big fan of Anne Carson. I think she's one of the poets and writers who inspires me the most in general, and also to inspire me to play and mess up, and her writing feels very close to drawing or painting to me, or maybe music. Um, I think in general she's always combining words together, using really weird forms, but instead of being confusing, it just feels good and right, um, especially if you're reading it that way out loud. So there's so much play happening in all of her writing, so I'm pretty obsessed with it. Um, and also this isn't to say that I understand or have even done much work at all in trying to make sense or interpret the stuff that she's saying. I just really like the vibes in general. And I think sometimes when you're engaging with art, that's completely fine and completely enough to sometimes experiences that aren't articulated or things that remain mysterious can stick with you in very significant ways. So not everything needs to be categorized or packaged into 140 characters or, or even shared with someone. So the first poem that we're reading is called Interview with Hara Tamiki. Death. Death made me grow up. Love. Love made me endure. Madness. Madness made me suffer. Passion. Passion bewildered me. Balance. Balance is my goddess. Dreams. Dreams are everything now. Gods. Gods cause me to be silent. Bureaucrats. Bureaucrats make me melancholy. Tears. Tears are my sisters. Laughter. I wish I had a splendid laugh. War. Ah, war. Humankind. Humankind is glass. Why not take the shorter way home? There was no shorter way home. So, actually when I was thinking about this poem, I actually went and did some very cursory research uh, and found out that um, Haratsumiki was a Japanese writer and survivor of the bombing of Hiroshima, and he also has really famous work too, um, the best known, which is called Summer Flower, uh, which was an account of the devastation that he witnessed in Hiroshima. So I pretty much just read the Wikipedia article about him, so if you're curious about him, you can do the same. Um, but in general, I'm always really appreciative of N. Carson's interview pieces. Uh, they feel really present to me and how, for the most part, at least the, the stuff that I've read and noticed, she doesn't really write me or myself or N. She almost always frames her dialogue with I, and that's very interesting to me. But I picked this, this poem in particular to read just because I like how it feels. Interviews are a dialogue between two people, and usually one person is always asking questions, and the other is answering, and sometimes that can be very good and illuminating. Um, like an example I can think of is Krista Tippett's podcast on being, where she asks very generous questions of other people who come onto her show. But in general, like in interviews are like kind of an inherently unbalanced exchange, but here she doesn't have like any question mark at all. It's just a prompt almost. So in that way, it's like herself and this speaker of Hara here just walking on this same path of thinking, same with her punctuation, which is one of the things I love the most about her writing. It's not really ever where you normally expect it to be, which throws you off, uh, but it feels very right, and like dialogue, or like people are talking, or like something very fresh out of your mind before you can think to pack it nicely. The next poem is called Father's Old Blue Cardigan. Now it hangs on the back of the kitchen chair where I always sit as it did on the back of the kitchen chair where he always sat. I put it on whenever I come in, as he did, stamping the snow from his boots. I put it on and sit in the dark. He would not have done this. Coldness comes paring down from the moonbone in the sky. His laws were a secret, but I remember the moment at which I knew he was going mad inside his laws. He was standing at the turn of the driveway when I arrived. He had on the blue cardigan with the buttons done up all the way to the top. 
Not only because it was a hot July afternoon, but the look on his face. As a small child who has been dressed by some aunt early in the morning for a long trip on cold trains and windy platforms, will sit very straight at the edge of his seat while the shadows, like long fingers, over the haystacks that sweep past keep shocking him because he is riding backwards. <laughs> This poem is relatively more grounded compared to, I think, a lot of the other poems that I've read by her, but I liked it. I liked the vibes, so that is one of the ones that I read today. Um, and it's made up of these stanzas of three lines, but they often have one line that's particularly long. Or if you look at the poem from far away, it's got these, like, jagged peaks. And throughout the whole thing, she's weaved this interesting feeling of, like, herself, and then her dad, and then her dad, and then herself. So, yes, part of it is, is playing with time in an interesting way, which she does later, when she sees her dad almost as a little kid, and then that line um, over the haystacks that sweep past keeps shocking him because he's riding backwards. I thought it's a very cool way to look at time overall. Okay, so third and final poem is in the TV men section of the book. Um, and I'm reading the Artaud section. So I'm just going to read the first part of this, which is the week of Artaud, because I actually have no idea what is happening in these in these parts, but I just liked it, so I wanted to read it for you. But please excuse the, the French pronunciation. They gave me a week to get Artaud and come up with a script. Those nights were like saints. Lundi, folie, mardi, cher. Mercredi, visage. Jeudi, Mexique. Vendredi, Terrida. Samedi, Sang. Dimanche, Eternel. Lundi. Artaud is mad. He stays close to the madness. Watching it breathe or not breathe, he deduces laws of rhythm which he divulges to his actors. They are to achieve a mastery of passions mathematically. The Artaud only sane. Observe the minutest push and pull within themselves of muscles grazed by emotion. Learn to render these as breath. Discover all that is feminine, all that reaches forward in supplication within us. The way a diver digs his heels into the ocean floor in order to rise to the surface. There is a sudden vacuum where before there was tension. For a toad, the real drawback of being mad is not that consciousness is crushed and torn, but that he cannot say so. Fascinating as this would be while it is happening, but only later when somewhat recovered and so much less convincingly. The mad state is, as he emphasizes over and over again, empty, teeming with emptiness, knotted on emptiness, immodest in its emptiness. 
you can pull emptiness out of it by the handful. I am not here. I am not here and never will be. You can pull it out endlessly. Le théâtre est le seul endroit au monde où un geste fait une recommence deux fois. Mardi. A primary characteristic of pain is its demand for an explanation. Knife wounds, assault with an iron bar, shock treatments, stigmata, scraping. He expresses satisfaction. A large part of his correspondence is addressed to doctors and their wives. Jemal implies Omafima. His favorite text from Van Gogh's letters to Theo describes drawing as a passage through an iron wall by force of will. For will, Artaud reads clou, une heure pour le caillot, mercredi. He makes profound use of his face. It is something of fire on which his soul wrote. Portraits show an icy dandy. Modeled by drugs and deprivation it took on an allure. Screams are heard in the most up-to-date hospitals. Taps his little leather heels together in the snow. Look over there, look down, look at me, not too sad. That's good. Bit of a smile, there it is, that's what I like. Now very pensive, eyes lower. Now look up, more, yes, yes. Psychiatry was invented as a defense against visionaries. Poetry, he lifts the plastic to show me, comes from a black lump within the body, sweats itself out. Body is pure. Everything loathsome is the mind, which God screws into a body with a lascivious thrust. Here's a sketch of himself as bones dated December 1948. He died in March. And a bit of lung for flashing light up onto the face from underneath. I beg you. Ne me représente en aucune façon. Je dis. In Mexico, it is useful to have the obsession of counting. For it gets lost in the membrane which shone like a pulverized sun, and only by adding up shadows can he find his way back to strange centers. From the dirty yellow table at which he sits to what it was on the forest floor. Servant full of pity, pearl red, blood of all that matter has endured before our toad. Like many a white man here, he wants to believe in God's birth, stare at it for hours. Car je fus un clan, mais pas roi. Entre dix. The unique, as Derrida puts it, eludes discourse. Artaud's adventure resists clinical or critical exegesis. It is a protest against exemplification itself. Artaud habitually destroys the history of himself as an example. History of a difference between his body and his mind. History that doctors and critics are combing and scouring after to comment on it. He wants both to speak and to forbid his speech being spirited away and placed in an order of truth for commentary. Artaud knew that all speech fallen from the body, offering itself to understanding or reception, offering itself to spectacle, is stolen speech. To speak in such a way that the theft blocks itself. His theater of cruelty is where he stages public attempts at this. But the prior stage is mind. Something is destroying my thinking, something furtive which takes away from me the words which I have found. To have thoughts which even he himself will not want to steal and repeat as speech. He must become so boring or abhorrent to himself that his language does not eavesdrop on its own calls. What holes and made of what? Samedi. To the scandal of language, he does not consent. False etymology makes him bold. He says ugly words from the sky. Car après, dit poématique, après viendra le temps du son. Puisque Emma, en grec, veut dire son. Et que poème doit vouloir dire après le sang, le sang après. Faisons d'abord poème avec ça. For after, said poetically, after will come the time of blood. Since Emma in Greek means blood, and poema ought to mean after the blood, the blood after. Let us first make a poem with blood. Violence is total here. He deliberately misspells the ancient Greek word for poem as poem then misdivides it into Po and Emma, two non-existent syllables in Greek, wrongly identifying Emma with the Greek word for blood, Haima, in order to etymologize poema as after the blood, after. But in what language does Po mean after? Poetically, indeed. Mais j'en ai assez, ce sera pour un prochain livre. Dimanche éternel. He died at dawn on 4th March. 
with spring snow in the ground, alone in his pavilion, seated at the foot of his bed, holding his shoe. His body did not burst into unforgettable fragments at his death, no. That summer was throughout Europe remarkable for its tempests. Here I am. What lightning? Was what people said as they strolled along. Et en effet, c'est trop peu pour moi. first section of the poem um and also i just looked up who our toad is and he is according to poetry foundation one of the most influential figures in the evolution of modern drama theory um and i think he was also a poet so i don't really have very many thoughts on the last one i just thought that it was so interesting to read when i first read it and so i thought it would be nice to share but yes Overall, a very interesting collection and vibrant as usual. So much playing in her work. I can't get enough of it. So that is pretty much all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time. Bye.